everyone, and welcome to the Uncorked Corner podcast, where we cover the full spread of food and beverage industry topics. My name is Bianca, PR and marketing professional by day and food and wine connoisseur by night. And my name is Nick, an accountant with a passion for barbecue, beer, and whiskey. Today, we welcome Peter Sandigan. Peter is a chef by training, currently a butcher by trade, and is the author of the new cookbook, Cooking Meat. In this episode, Peter takes us through his deep-rooted interest in cooking and meats why he decided to start a butcher shop, and what his new book is all about. If you enjoy this podcast, don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review wherever you listen to us. With that said, let's welcome Peter to the show. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Uncorked Corner podcast. Today, we are excited to be welcoming Peter Sanigan of Cooking Meat. First off, we are going to have Peter introduce himself to, to all of you guys and give us some background on how he got to the publishing of the book, Cooking Meat. Sure. Thanks, Bianca. Um, so I opened uh, my butcher shop about 11 years ago after working as a chef for about 15 years. So... Uh, I worked in a lot of really good restaurants, uh, working with a lot of uh, really good farmers uh, through the years, um, as well as did uh, a stint in Italy, um, worked a bit up north, north of Toronto, uh, and really became um, familiar with, with, with the farmers that uh, supplied my restaurants. Uh, and realize that there is a bit of a lack of representation of their products in stores in Toronto. At the time, there was, there was a couple of really good butcher shops that, that are still around today, but um, it, it just was, for a city of three plus million people, it just seemed like there wasn't uh, as much representation down here. So um, I left restaurant kitchens and decided to open a very small store, which is what I could afford at the time in Kensington Market in downtown Toronto. Um, and it was only 400 square feet, like, like really, really small. And, uh, I, I kind of just kept going from there. I, um, I made it my mission to, you know, to, to serve really top quality meats and proteins, um, from local family farms. Uh, and then also with a, uh, um, with a real kind of focus on, on the customer service that I was used to in the restaurant world. So making sure that every interaction is a uh, is positive and that we're we're also contributing like uh, one of our focuses and our, our philosophies here is that we contribute to the best part of someone's day which is the best part of, which i believe is is being able to sit down and eat and drink with family and friends i think that's a really um a really important time uh not everyone gets to do it every day uh so when you do get to do it, it, it it's, it's really special and um and should be treated as such and because so many people do eat meat and there, there are lots who don't but the ones that do um it is the focus of you most most likely it's the focus of the meal so I, I wanted to make sure that our butcher shop kind of catered to that uh that idea and then that after i guess eight years or nine years later is when i started talking to uh the publishers of the cookbook uh to kind of translate that same um philosophy, I suppose, into a book of uh, how to shop for meat, how to choose meat, and then also how to cook it with different um, cooking techniques, uh, as well as you're kind of, I, I really wanted it to be um, something that someone who doesn't, is unfamiliar with cooking meat, like doesn't know how to roast a chicken, for example, uh, will be able to find a recipe that can help them become a better cook and be more comfortable with meat. As well as obviously, I should, well, I shouldn't say obviously, but we have, uh, you know, we, we, we run the gamut of a lot more technical recipes as well with, you know, we delve into some charcuterie and um, uh, some things like whole roasted suckling pig and, and stuff like that. That's, that's a little bit outside of the norm that I, I think is important to showcase too, because it's, it's food from around the world that is really important part of, uh, of, of people's celebrations, whether it's you know, small celebrations are large, and these days it's only small. But, <laughs> uh, uh, but yeah, it's it, that that's what kind of guided me to write this book is to as a, as a reference and um, a guidepost for people who 
really want to know about meat, not just where it comes from, um, but also how to how to treat it, and 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 also with with a um, a wide array of different cuts that you don't normally see uh, in grocery stores, so that people, even if they don't get to get to cook with it, they at least have a reference so they can become familiar with what it looks like and and what the best cooking techniques are. And what was it that, you know, you've been a chef by training and a butcher by trade. So what was it that really inspired you to even get involved with the industry in the first place? With the, the food industry, like before, from when I was a teenager, yes. like 30 years ago. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, I've always loved food. I actually was, uh, um, I, the first time I started cooking for myself was I, I actually was a vegetarian in, in high school. Um, I, uh, I, I decided that I wasn't, I, I couldn't bring myself to, to consume the kind of meat that I didn't know where it was coming from because I didn't know anything about it at the time. And I was 16 and I started, and my mother uh, intelligently so wouldn't um, cook for me. <laughs> she had three other kids and a family and everything like that. To, and my father as well. I shouldn't just say my mother, my father. My, both my parents, neither of them, neither of them uh, uh, catered to my vegetarianism. So I had to figure out how to cook for myself. And so I got a, a vegetarian cookbook uh, for Christmas. And that lasted about six months because I was just jonesing for meat after that. I could, it was, it was, I, I was, uh, I was very tired a lot <laughs> of those days. So in any case, so I, um, I really liked it. I, I really enjoyed cooking. I, I enjoyed cooking for myself. And then um, in my last year of high school, which is now, well, which was grade 13 back then, um, my family uh, moved to Hong Kong from Toronto. And I went there with the sole purpose of just trying to um, pass the time before coming back to Toronto to finish up my schooling. So I had about six months where I, I, I was able to, quote, discover myself uh, at 17 years old, which is um, impossible to do. Uh, but I did start cooking over there for, um, for my family and, uh, sometimes they'd have, you know, business associates over. So I would cook for them terribly. I'm sure, uh, they were very nice about it all. Um, and then that kind of, that made me want to explore it as a career. And I came back to Toronto and I finished up high school and I got a job right away in restaurants. And, um, yeah, that kind of was the, uh, what, 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 what triggered everything. It's definitely interesting to go from a vegetarian lifestyle into kind of a life centered around meat. And you did a lot better than I did. Last time I tried to go vegetarian, I made it about five days. So <laughs> six months is a lot better than that. Uh, yeah. Was there a particular recipe that you really, that really inspired you to start writing the cookbook that you said, oh, this is a recipe that I need to get out and uh, everyone should know how to do? Uh, not necessarily. If any, like the, the, there was an, there was a, um, uh, an incident that 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 happened that did inspire the actual writing of the cookbook. I've always uh, a bit of perspective. I've always kind of enjoyed writing, and I I, I enjoyed writing recipes. And um, I've I've maintained a blog for the uh, for the shop's website, um, you know, contributing recipes to that. But uh, it was maybe about four years ago, and I was having a conversation with my brother, who's uh, four years younger than me. And uh, we were we were talking at uh, at my parents' house, and he was talking about how his partner um, she sometimes didn't get home uh, until uh, late from from her work because she had a, a long drive to get into work, and they have two small kids, and he he was admitting to being pretty useless in the kitchen, and saying how on those nights when Danielle wouldn't get home in time, he would just make them peanut butter sandwiches, and he was thirty six at the time. And I, I called him out on, on being, being semi useless in the kitchen, which to be fair, he's, <laughs> he, he's not completely, but he kind of, we, we, we were kind of jostling about it. And uh, I, uh, I, I realized then that like, and, and also with my years of serving customers here and, and, and fielding questions like, oh, I, I, I don't know how to roast a whole chicken or what do you do with pork belly or, you know, what's a hanger steak? I've never seen that before. You have these questions you realize that there's there's a real lack of information given that the internet has all the information in the world ever it, it, it's not contained and i i felt i feel like there's a real 
um, with cookbooks, there's a real kind of tangible quality that like that can be um, uh, that 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 is really great to to have for references. So whether it's like um, you know you want to learn about Persian food and you go to uh, uh, Naomi Duguid's book about Persian food and that's a great reference for that. I felt like I really needed to. I didn't need to, but I wanted to create a reference for people that were just kind of like, like my brother and being like, okay, I don't know how to cook. Um, or I do know how to cook, but I don't know how lambs are raised. Or I, 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 I do like to cook, but I only really like to cook chicken. And I'm, I'm kind of afraid of beef because it's so expensive. I don't want to screw it up. Like th those are, those are all questions that I, I really wanted to address in the book. Um, you know, what the difference between back ribs and side ribs are for pork. You know, like it, we, we've become, um, especially in Toronto, we've become very accustomed to, you, you know, uh, uh, there, there's some wonderful cooks, home cooks in the city, but there's a lot of people that also just um, rely on restaurants and takeout and, and, and then the recipes that they know, like they might have a killer, uh, whatever, uh, uh, sausage recipe that they kind of keep going back to. Uh, so so yeah hopefully uh this book will kind of expand people's horizons and and let them see something outside of what they're just used to and where people you know they do get used to things and kind of feel like they can't explore new avenues of cooking how do you encourage someone who comes in and wants to try something new to kind of break outside of that personal you know resistance that's holding them back to really be more open-minded about the food that they're choosing and, and making well, a lot of that comes down to customer trust and, and relationships. I mean, we're lucky to be in a position where we have a lot of regulars and we have a lot of people that come in um, who, at first, I mean, trust is a big, um, uh, uh, a, bi a big piece of the puzzle when it comes to cooking. Because like when, when people, if you go to a grocery store and you don't know, let, let's just focus on meat for a second, never mind vegetables and fish and stuff. If you don't know a lot about meat, you're unlikely to be able to talk to a meat clerk even if there's one there because there's usually only a couple and they're, and they're really busy and they might not have all the answers uh, for you so we're in a position to be able to um, talk to our customers and maybe they come in just for ground beef the first couple of times and then they're like oh okay I had the ground beef you know like very often conversations will start like that they'll come in and say like oh okay I had the, the flat iron steak and I really liked it but I would I want to do steak again I want to try something else what do you recommend um, so that trust develops. It, it's not something that normally it's, I should say, it's normally not something that happens right away. People don't come in right away and be like, okay, like, you, you know, I'm, you, my, my dinner's in your hands. What do you, what do you want? Because like, I, at the end of the day, I, you know, even myself, I, like I've cooked so much food over <laughs> 44 years. I, I, I think that, um, I like, I don't necessarily go right into a new butcher shop and say to the butcher, okay, well, what do you got for me today? You know, because like, I, you know, I need to kind of develop that rapport and, and figure out every butcher shop and every fishmonger and every vegetable. So they, they have their own specialty. So it's, it's, it's really important to be um, going and having those conversations and also shopping in a place where conversations can actually occur. Uh, I think that's a really important part of, of life that we, um, we've kind of lost a little bit with the advent and, and popularity of grocery stores from the, you know, from the seventies onwards, like it's, it's been a part of my entire life. And, and it wasn't until I opened the butcher shop that I was, I was like, Oh my gosh, this is like such a wonderful, um, a wonderful experience for not just myself, but for my customers and my staff. And yeah. So I think I answered, I, I think I answered your question. <laughs> I apologize. We're, we're going into Thanksgiving this week and it's been a lot of early morning. So it's uh, my, my, my brain is it might be a little fried. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. And speaking of Thanksgiving, uh, meat, you don't typically think of as being seasonal, like fruits and vegetables, because, you know, animals live year round. So yeah. there's always the ability to have that. But when it comes to obviously Thanksgiving, you got turkey, maybe around Christmas, or something you got ham. Are there any sort of seasonalities that you see owning a butcher, butcher shop, things that go a lot more frequently during certain times of the year, maybe during the summer, spring, et cetera? Yeah, so that, that's a, kind of a bit of a two-part question because there's, there's definitely um, 
there's definitely a season for certain cuts that people are just kind of used to cooking at certain times of the year. Like for example, you know, ribs in the summertime, you know, people want to, you know, slow cook ribs on their, their charcoal barbecue or their smokers. Uh, briskets similar also depending on there's certain religious holidays where, um, you know, like, like whether it's Rosh Hashanah and, and briskets or Easter and, and lamb. Um, so there's, there, there's those kinds of seasons where, where certain types of food are just more popular. Obviously Thanksgiving is Turkey and, um, uh, you know, we sell more of those types of things at different, those specific times of year. Uh, there's also something to be said for like, it used to be like, like meat used to be a lot more seasonal. Like you would, you would not see lamb much outside of spring and summer. Um, we have a, a very unique, uh, I guess, terroir or ecosystem here in, in Canada where, in Ontario specifically, where, uh, yes, we can raise animals year round, but um, the animals, based on what they're eating, have a different flavor profile throughout the year. And what I mean by that is that, like a lot of animals, like say beef, take beef, for example, uh, beef uh, steers um, will be uh, what's called finishing, like mo most animals are finished which means the last like two, three months of their lives, like most of their lives they're eating, they eat grass in the last couple of months, they're, they're, uh, they're eating more grain corn ration. And, and that's specifically to uh, produce a higher carbohydrate diet is supposed to produce a, a lot more marbling, which in North America, we really like and that sweet, sweet fat. Um, but depending on the time of year, those animals will like in, in late summer, for example, they'll also be, eating a lot of grasses throughout that finishing period, as opposed to say in deep February, where they're just really on, on that grain diet with maybe some silage, which is a fermented hay. So like it, the, the flavor profile of meat will kind of change throughout the year, depending on the animal, depending on how it was raised. Um, but for the most part though, you're right. Like we, 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 we do have access to uh, great meat year round. Uh, there's some things that just aren't available, like pastured chicken, for example. A lot of people like pastured chicken, which is chicken that is you, is only raised um, in fields to eat whatever they can find. They might be given some a grain ration if they aren't getting enough, you know, uh, food from from the land. But for the most part, they just eat grubs and worms and 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 whatever. But those are really only available fresh, August, September, October. Outside of those really three or four months, um, you can get frozen. But like, I, I know people that will say like, they only want to eat pastured meats. It's like, okay, well that's fine. But you have to at least then commit to eating frozen meat for a lot of the year, which is fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, but it's just that it's the understanding of, of how that kind of plays out for people, right? Is that they'll have to make those, make those choices. That, and that those are the consequences, which is, you know, nothing wrong with them. And your book is different from most book where books where it really focuses on farming labels, everything consumers should know about the meat that they're consuming and how they're getting it. What are a few key takeaways? I know there's a lot in the book and it's really well done, by the way. It looks fantastic. Oh, thank you. Yeah, of course. And, um, <laughs> what are a few key takeaways that you would want readers to know before, you know, they're, they're going to purchase this book and make that decision on their own. But what are a few things that you think are the most important that they might learn from it? So my, the thing I hope that people really take away from this book is, um, is the, 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 is, is all, I don't want to say altering, but like kind of really thinking about how you shop and I, I, not everyone has access to a small local butcher or a big local butcher or whatever. Not, not a lot of everyone does in this province and that, that's okay. Grocery stores, there's nothing wrong with grocery stores. What I do want the takeaway to be is when you're in the grocery stores, like for example, I, my wife's family uh, lives in Stratford, Ontario. And when I go out there, there's a grocery store I go to where I know they carry certain products from the, the, that area and I'm able to uh, identify that. And then I'm able to, if I wanted to chat with the, 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 the meat clerks or the butchers about that particular product because you can't find it in other grocery stores. And, and it's not like an independent, it's like a, a food land or a metro or something like that. I guess like they, I, I don't know how their buying system works, their supply chain, but somehow 
they're able to source locally for their own independent store. Um, and it's, the, it's those little things that, that it's really important to, I, 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 like, I hope that people get from this is that it's really important to pay attention to what you're doing when you're shopping for your food. Because like I said at the beginning of this conversation, I believe that sitting down to eat, no matter, it can be a bowl of craft dinner, I don't care sitting out to eat with people is the best part of your day. It, it, it's, it's probably going to be outside of sleeping. It's going to be the best part of your day. So, so you really have to take that in consideration and say like, okay, well, I, I want to eat. I want to make the, I want to make that part of the, my day as good as it can be. So whether it should be really tasty food, if you drink, it should be tasty wine or tasty beer or tasty juice or whatever it is. If you just eat, like if you just I shouldn't say just but if you if you only eat stuff that you don't care about or that that that's not really good good for you and I don't mean like in necessarily healthy which it should be but good for you like it like it should make you feel good when you eat it you know what I mean like food should be shoot, food should feel good when you eat it like you should have after even if you sit down for 20 minutes and you're just shooting the shit with your with your friend um afterwards you'd be like okay well that was fun now what you know what I mean? Like that should be in my opinion, anyways. And a lot of people in, in the food and wine industry, like that's, that's why we all kind of got in, got into this thing because some part of us really likes eating and drinking and sitting down and having fun and having conversation and listening to music. And that whole thing is, is, is really, really important. So the takeaway that I'm hoping that people get from this book is, is, uh, if you don't already think of meals as being such a great part of your day to start thinking of it like that and start really kind of focusing on, okay, well, you know, yeah, so, some meals take some prep time, you know, some things you're going to make, like, you got to start thinking ahead. You think, okay, well, today is Tuesday. What am I going to do on Thursday? Oh, this takes, you know, 24 hours to marinate. I might as well get that and start it up. You know, like too many, too often we're like, we're like, oh my, oh my God, it's six o'clock. What am I going to eat for dinner or what am I going to feed my family or whatever? Uh, and it's, and it's fine. Like I do that very commonly, but I'm also a trained chef and I can get something pretty decent on the table within 20 minutes. Right. Not everyone can do that. So it's a luxury for, for me and my family, but I also, I also need to plan ahead because I'm extremely busy and like everyone else. And, you know, we want to make sure that we're, 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 carving out that time for something good for us yeah yeah i'm with you there and i've been cooking for myself since high school as well like you were saying earlier right. um and that's when i really learned kind of the difference of the superstore supermarket meat versus getting at a local butcher shop uh there was a real clear switch where i you know always went to the supermarket just got whatever they had got my boneless skinless chicken breast whatever and then i was like this you know this isn't how chicken should taste this doesn't yeah. seem right so I started going to a local butcher shop and I experimented, went to a few different ones until I finally found one. And nice. then I moved and I moved up to Maine. So I had to start that process all over again. Right on. My question for you is, how do you suggest to our listeners finding that local butcher shop that they can really get a dialogue going with the person behind the counter? I know there's three or four around me. I've been to all of them. Uh, depending on what I'm looking for, I go to the different ones, like you were saying, yeah. some of them have a lot more I'm a, during the summer and especially when I have a, when I go to my girlfriend's vacation house, you got a smoker out there and I had one back home before I moved them in an apartment. Now I can't have one. Um, <laughs> but I always like doing barbecue. So when I'm doing that, I have to go somewhere that specialize, you know, I can go there. I can get a full 13 pound big pack of brisket. I can get the ribs. I can get stuff like that uh, mm -hmm. where other places don't really always have that. Uh, yeah. Some of them have better selection of maybe pre-marinated meats, something that you can just grab. It's already marinated, you get it home, throw it on the grill, do what you got to do. Uh, yeah. But how do you suggest to people to really explore those and find the right one for them? Well, I think you just told everyone how to do it. <laughs> no, it's, it's true though. I mean, it's, it, it, so the, the reality is, is that not every neighborhood has a butcher shop anymore and not every, like, it's the same as, you know, barbers shops and, you know, florists or, or little veg stands, right? Like there's, they're, they're, they're unfortunately that those kind of main street stores are unfortunately not as popular and, and not as, not as, um, not everywhere like they used to be. Now, 
having said that, um, they're usually, even in the country, in the small towns, there's usually at least one or two people that are doing something uh, uh, with the, with so, so, something meat centric around there. Um, so I, I, I don't know, like, like I recommend, I, well, it's interesting. So, so for someone who owns a butcher shop has written a book, loves meat, loves cooking, loves people. I'm actually like a lot, like, I think I'm similar to a lot of people where I'm a little bit shy when it comes to talking to, uh, to people at, at a, at a store. Um, uh, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to look silly in front of people. I don't want to sound, sound like I don't know what I'm talking about. I think that's a pretty common uh, fear that a lot of people have when they're going into, like, especially when they're going into a space like a butcher shop that they feel very, or they, they can feel a little bit intimidated by the, the situation. Like fish is a good one. I go into fish stores and I know, I know enough about fish uh, to ask the right questions, but I know like a lot of people, especially like we're in Toronto, so it's pretty landlocked and like outside of lake fish, and then the popular, like the, the banger cuts, you know, your tuna, your salmon, your trout, stuff like that. If someone saw monkfish for the first time, they would be like, what the hell is that? And if you're in a, if you're in like a, 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 a store that like a lot of times it seems like you go into a store, especially like in Toronto anyways, we're, we're blessed with being a very diverse, having a very diverse population. And so there's like, say, if you take fish stores, there's the Portuguese fish store, there'll be the Caribbean fish store, there'll be the Italian fish store. And as, um, as someone who's none of those has not doesn't have that background in my in my in my blood, going into those stores can be a little intimidating, right. But just as in, as important as it is to realize that it's that it is intimidating, it's also important to just be like, screw it, I'm, I'm going to ask the questions that I think are dumb. And we're going to find out what happens. And I've asked the I've there's only one time in my life where I've asked a question and been treated like I, I'm a dum dum, and that was in a very small town in Croatia, and nothing against Croatia, but like nobody spoke English in this town, and it was like I I, I was just really trying hard to get what I wanted, and they were like, "Nah, we're just we're just not gonna we're we're not gonna do this," and it, that was the only time. Every other time, and it's hundreds of other times, and especially in North America there's where the language isn't a barrier um uh, it's always like don't be afraid to ask a question that you think might it might be foolish because it, it's not there's no such thing as a foolish question like no nobody should like that was something like i was very determined when i opened my shop that like nobody should feel uh discouraged from from shopping because they they might be a little bit green around a barbecue or around a stove or whatever you know like that's that's not the right way to do customer service full stop but that's also not the right way to like like they, anyone who does that is just gonna have a bad impression of what a butcher shop is you know a butcher shop shouldn't be a place of you know like a bunch of cuts that you're not sure what it is and people just not helping you it should be it should be you know a world of opportunity <laughs> of you know what you're gonna be eating for dinner so and I agree with that. And I think that's important for everyone to kind of take away is that none of us that aren't trained chefs are ever shown an anatomical picture of a cow of all the different cuts. And then the same thing with chickens and the same thing with all these different animals. Like if you're a butcher, you might be familiar with because you're seeing yeah. them every day. If you don't have that training, you're all you're seeing is a piece of meat on the shelf or behind the counter, or wherever it is. Um, yeah. And you know, you can't see that on the cow. You don't know comparing that to another one. Yeah, I know sirloin's typically this. I know flank steak's typically that. But you don't yeah. really know, you know, this is where it's coming from. This is why this one's fattier than another, you know. So people yeah. should really approach it with a learning attitude and not be afraid to ask questions. Yeah, and I, I hope I answered some of those questions in the cookbook too, right? With the photography and, and laying it out and stuff like that and how, um, uh, you, you know, like, like how, how to kind of, um, how, how to f get people just familiar with what things look like, right? I think that's important. You've also mentioned living in several different places and traveling to different places. What has been your favorite experience from the standpoint where you're really trying foods kind of everywhere? Is there one that really stands out? Um, like, how, how do you mean? Like, like, is there a place in the world that I, I feel like it like stands out in terms of uh, the type of food. Yeah, like the cuisine that you experienced there, just like the overall food experience. 
Yeah, I, I, I have been lucky enough to go to a lot of places. Um, uh, you know, every, every country and every city has its own treasures, so to speak of, of, of you know, um, and, and I'm a big fan of going to restaurants and going to food markets when I'm traveling. So I'm always seeing and learning about cool new stuff. Like I was in Sicily a few years ago and, and it, Sicily has, is one of the most beautiful places on earth. And, and it not only is it beautiful, the food is wonderful. The people are, are delightful. The markets are so cool. There's like fish markets there where they'll, they'll have like full swordfish on display. And it's the market that it's not like a tourist market. It's like, that's where people shop. And it, so yeah, like the, the Sicily was amazing. Uh, the last trip um, I was able to take with my wife before uh, uh, the, the pandemic shut everything down was actually in Quebec city. Um, and I had a wonderful, wonderful experience at a restaurant called uh, the Pied Bleu, which does um, uh, very, uh, like a very meat heavy, and so appropriate for me, I suppose, a very meat heavy and charcuterie heavy um, uh, menu based on traditions of France and in, in from the north down to Lyon. And, uh, and I, I encourage anyone if they're like to check that restaurant out, if they're, it, you'll leave so full and so happy. And, it, and, and actually that was like, again, is the last time, and I don't know when we're going to be able to go away again. So thank, thank God it was a really good <laughs> one when we went away. But uh, uh, the, uh, everything that I'm talking about, about, you know, the, the joy of eating and the joy of, of, of uh, being together and drinking wine and drinking uh, uh, good uh, brandies after a, a meal full of rich, fatty sausages and foie gras and stuff like that. It was, yeah, that, that to me was a, it was a fantastic experience there. Yeah. yeah that's definitely that's somewhere awesome. I'll have to check out too. I'm not too far from that where I'm in Maine, but five hour drive. Yeah, there you go. City, Just so. sneak across the border. Yeah. Road trip. <laughs> We're right now, maybe not, guys. but what was that? Whereabouts in Maine are you? I'm in Portland. Oh, I love Portland. That's yep. a beautiful town. Jay's Oysters. I had a, I, I, in Portland, so that's another place I've, I've been to where I had a, lot of great eating um experiences there are tons of places and, and i think i had the largest oyster i've ever tried to eat at jay's oysters down on the, the waterfront and it was it was too big it was like half the size of my face it's <laughs> awesome yeah we've i haven't tried them yet i'll definitely have to give them a shot we moved up here a little over a year ago so it's i mean there's so many restaurants and so many food experiences to have yeah. it's tough to get to all of them uh yeah. what other places were you able to visit when you're in the area um we went to uh oh wow um there's like a there's like a like a lobster shack on the on the wharf that's kind of touristy that we went to i can't remember the name of it um oh, lobster company maybe yeah may, maybe it's right on the the pier there yep. and then um there's another place that was like there's well there's a couple other places i, I can't remember the names of them but um uh there's a place it was kind of like a scandinavian design of the room it was very sparse anyways whatever uh, yeah like yeah it's a great that's what i mean like, like you asked the question everywhere has treasures right and i'm lucky enough to be at an age where i'm like okay you know i've been i've been to a lot of places in the world because i've kind of just decided to go like sometimes with a little bit of money and sometimes with no money and it doesn't matter if you have money or not you can always find those treasures and find those fun things to eat because I, there's been, for most of my life, I've had no money. So when, when I travel, the big expenses like the hotel and the, and the plane ticket or the, uh, or now it's Airbnb. Uh, but back in the day, it would be a hostel or something like that. So you spend whatever money you have on eating and drinking, you know, and, and, and walking. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the good thing about food is that even though you can't travel and go places right now, you can recreate your favorite global cuisines at home. There you um, go. I've recently started ordering a lot of the meats that, well, my fiance is a hunter, so we actually have a lot of uh, fresh meat that he, you know, he gets and we make it at home, like, um, like the venison, and things like yeah. that. But I we do. Like, is that a white tail on your wall behind you? <laughs> there, yeah, that's a deer up there on our yeah. wall. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Um, but we've recently started ordering meats that obviously, you know, you can't get like that um, yeah. from the local butcher. And we have a lot up here, which I think makes sense because we actually have a lot of farms up here as well that are raising, you know, 
cows and chickens and all that. Um, but one of the things that I've started to experiment with more is veal, which was something that I've never, I've never cooked. I've never tried it. I was kind of like one of those people that wasn't exploratory at all with food until probably the past couple of years. Um, and just, you know, doing this podcast and talking to a lot of authors and stuff, we've, I've totally expanded my food horizons. Um, but yeah, but it, with no restaurant experience, I mean, I obviously am not a chef by any means. And I think a lot of the people who are reading your book, you know, they probably won't be. Uh, so yeah. what would your insight be on approaching cooking new cuts of meat for the first time? Um, well, so in the, uh, in the book, I try to do a, 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 a I, we, I try to make a lot of parallels to things like, so, um, like when describe, describing cuts, whether it's on a lamb or a, um, a beef or chicken or whatever, uh, trying to make sure that people feel like they connected to something they might be a little bit more familiar with. Um, like I have a cut, like a chapter on game actually. And, and in that we talk about like partridge and, um, you know, duck obviously and quails and stuff like that. And, and just try to get people who would not normally maybe roast a whole duck think like, okay, it's, it's not that much different than a fatty chicken. Let, let's, let's just strip away like what, you know, what you might be afraid of um, and, and, and relate it to something that you, you are, are comfortable with. Uh, because I think that's a really important part is that most people, there's very few things in the, in the meat world that are, um, that are, that are, are, are really scary to approach. And I think most people, myself included, are most concerned about screwing up something that costs a lot of money. That's, that's, I think one of the things. So like, like chicken, for example, chicken and, and certain cuts of pork are, uh, are, are considered very economical. So a lot of people will gravitate towards those for their kind of first try. Like even like, like a rack of ribs, you, you know, you might, someone might be like, okay, I've never smoked rack uh, or I've never, you know, slow cooked a rack of ribs before. I, I want to try it. I'm a little afraid of it, but it's only going to set me back 10 bucks. And if I screw it up, I'm not, you know, I'm not out a lot of money as opposed to say like Wagyu beef, someone's spending $150 on a, you know, a half pound of meat They're They're obviously it's a different ball game. So that kind of stuff that that stratospherically expensive um, stuff isn't as, uh, isn't the stuff that, that you're going to come across every day. So it's important to be able to, um, I think if you, if you enjoy food and if you enjoy cooking, it's important to, um, kind of get outside your comfort zone once in a while, whether it's like once, it can be only once a month. It doesn't have to be like re a regular thing. Like if you, if you have a, 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 a great recipe for, you know, a stewed beef and you have a great chili recipe and you have a great, uh, you know, sausage and peppers recipe and, and a pasta with uh, chicken or whatever it is. Those are your kind of standards. And then every once in a while, like just, just go outside of your comfort zone and uh, try something that, you know, otherwise you might, you, you might be, you know, kind of uh, afraid to cook, if you will. And you'd be surprised. That's the other thing too. Like it, it's actually not, it's actually really hard to screw up uh, meat. The, 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 the big things that you, you the, the, some of the only things that you can do to screw up meat is you either burn it and that can happen, but like you, but that's the kind of stuff that you, like you put it in the oven and then you go and you forget about something that's in the oven and then it burns, right? So, uh, or over salting. If you over salt something like a stew or a chili or a soup or something like that, it's really hard to, you can't, you can't really do much about it. Outside of like those kind of things, and I'm sure there's a few others that I'm not thinking about right now, but outside of those kind of major disaster type things, everything can be saved, everything can be salvaged, everything can be used and eaten and enjoyed. You can always add seasoning to things. So like, if you're worried it's under seasoned, you can always kick it up a little bit with a little bit of salt or whatever, or spices. If it's overcooked, over, like, an overcooked steak is still a steak. It's still going to be fine. It's not, it's not a big deal. People are like, oh, I don't want to overcook this ribeye. It's like a ribeye is a great example of a, a steak you potentially could overcook because it's so fatty. You're still going to get, it's still going to be juicy. You know, if you get a flank steak that is traditionally a working muscle, a tougher meat, and you overcook that, 
yeah, it, it's, it's going to be a little dry, but if you slice it thinly against the grain, you, you, it, it, it will be okay. It, it's not going to be the end of the world. And I, I talk about some of that stuff in the book, obviously, like, like, how, like outside of certain recipes, just looking at flank steak in particular and saying like how, how you should treat it while you cook it, after you cook it, you know, how, how to get the best, the, the most enjoyment out of it, maximum enjoyment. Because like, yeah, like, as I said, at the end of the day, either you've, you've, you, you've, you've incinerated something, which is like borderline, you know, time to call the fire department anyways, or you, you salt the crap out of it. And it's like, yeah, I can't, I can't deal. Or you put like way too many scotch bonnets in, in something. And it's so, and it's like your face is on fire. Like those are the kind of things that can screw up a dish. Like overcooking a steak isn't a big deal. Undercooking a brisket. Yeah. That could be a big deal if it's too, if it's, too, if it's not, if it's not tender, but what do you do? You put a little bit more water in and you, you leave it in the oven for an extra half hour. It's, it's fixable. You know what I mean? So, so like, Everything is a little daunting at first until you've done it a couple times. And then you're like, okay, well, yeah, yeah, I get this. I get this. It's like driving a car, you know, like at first driving, like I was actually talking to one of my butchers today who just got his license last year and he was so proud of himself because he just merged onto a highway for the first time this weekend. And I'm like, I've been merging on a highway since I was 16. I'm like, it's not, but I remember that feeling the first time you go in, you're like, holy shit, I'm going to die and take a bunch of these cars with me. And it's like, no, you're not. You're fine. That doesn't happen. You know, it, do, it, uh, it doesn't commonly happen, <laughs> I should say. So, yeah, it's just, just, just trying things and getting out there. And you're going to feel really good about yourself after you've done it, too. Well, we are really excited to try a whole bunch of the stuff that's in this book and to really just be more conscious of the things that we're consuming. Oh. For our uh, listeners who are interested in getting the book for themselves, can you tell us when it will be available, where it will be available, and how they can get it? Absolutely. So it's going, it's uh, being released on October 20th, uh, 2020. So in a two weeks from now or thing or so. Um, and it's available in North America, both in Canada and the States uh, through Amazon, uh, amazon.com in the States, barnesandnoble.com in the States, uh, Indiegogo, Indiegogo, Indiebound, I believe that I, it's a, a seller in this, another online seller in the States. Uh, in Canada, it's amazon.ca and uh, uh, indigo.ca as well as in if you're in the Toronto area come on down to the cook or to to our store and I'll have a signed copy for you <laughs> uh, and then also off of our website too if you're in the in the Ontario region awesome we appreciate you taking the time and again so this is going to be released actually on the 20th so it's Wonderful. there get well, online get your book and, uh, yep <laughs> <laughs> cheers thank you cheers. very much guys all right take care to follow us on social at Uncorked Corner and on the blog at uncorkedcorner.com for a taste of more food and beverage content. And if you enjoyed the show, don't forget to leave a comment, subscribe, rate, and review on whatever podcast platform you prefer. Thanks for listening.